after those remarks, uh, I feel a bit scared to say anything, <laughs> just in case um, I say something and do leave the room disappointed with me. <laughs> so perhaps I say thank you for meeting you and goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> Now, I know we have very little time. Um, we do have a, it's about one hour, one hour to tell my story, and one hour to hopefully to be able to inspire you. Um, so I will try to be brief, um, but um, the story must always be told from when it started uh, to try and tell you where I am now. Uh, you may not get a good feeling or a good feel of where I'm coming from. Um, on the, or as a whole, Africa is very much associated with um, poverty. Uh, for many years, we've been talking of Africa being poor. Tanzania being poor. And when you look into the list of um, uh, countries in terms of income, you find that we are very, very low there. Because the third also from the bottom, we are, we are considered to be a very poor country. But you know, I disagree with the way countries are graded. Um, I disagree with the list of uh, rich and poor countries. To me, it's not about the country, it's about the people of that country. If we say Tanzania is a poor country, I think it's wrong. But the people of Tanzania are poor. So we have to distinguish between the poverty of the people and poverty of a country. Uh, African countries are not poor. But the people of Africa are poor. If you talk of a poor country all the time, people become discouraged and they say, well, my country is very poor, what can I do? But the countries of Africa are not poor. So I start from there. I was born in a rich country called Tanzania. <laughs> I've, I saw poverty, which in, in you, in your dreams, in your eyes, would be something totally unheard of, unexperienced. I was born in a little mud hut in northern Tanzania. And um, in that hut, it was not only for, for me and my family to live in, it all also um, accommodated um, a cow accommodated some goats, accommodated some, you know what, even some rats and some cockroaches. That's the reality of life where I'm coming from. So I have seen poverty in the proper sense. And I, I think I'm coming from the poor of the poor. A meal a day was not something that um, came about easily. A pair of shoes to go to school with um, was something unheard of. The normal was one uniform, which you could use during the day and uh, wash in the evening and uh, press it with charcoal iron and uh, go to school in the morning looking decently dressed. But I had one uniform. Whenever I was like, I had one meal a day. Um, I walked um, to school barefoot, long distance. So I grew up in poverty. I'm not saying that uh, I, I'm different from many other Africans. Perhaps I'm in a, a typical example of a poor African. But poverty to me did not uh, mean a problem. 
To me, poverty was a challenge. The difference is very big between challenge and a problem. A problem lies on your shoulders and pulls you down. And when you go to bed in the night, you can't sleep. There's a problem. But the moment you convert a problem to a challenge, the challenge will never rest on your shoulders. Challenge will never pull you down. Challenge will stay in front of you and you will try to punch it. If you win, you go to bed in peace. If you lose, it doesn't matter, damn, it's packed there anyway. In the morning, you pick it up again and fight again, uh, uh, try to, to overcome the challenge. So you can see a big difference between people who look at life as being full of problems and people who look at life as being full of challenges. The winners in this life see things as challenges and they win. The ones who see things as problems, they, of time and time again, the problems pull them down. And you meet somebody in the, uh, along um, the Patrick Avenue and he's walking his shoulders down. He says, what's the matter? Hey, problems, problems, because they are so heavy on his shoulders. But the guy who is looking at things as challenges, he walks up right down and says, well, you know, I have challenges in front of me. I must, I'm going to overcome them. So, so to me, poverty did not, was not a problem. Poverty was a challenge. But then, then what? How did they get out of that poverty? I'm not going to tell you things which you don't know of. Whatever I'm going to tell you today will be things which you know of. But there is a big difference between me and you, and you, guys, you people, you guys. You have just said uh, you, you, you are graduates and are graduates of universities. You are graduates of colleges and universities. Yes, I went through that. But there is a second stage, that is the universe of life. I've been through that. You are still now walking to it. Universe of life is different from Yale. Because then you see life in reality. You see life in real sense. Um, what then did, did help me to pull out of poverty? One thing is certain. I think my belief in God did help me. If you believe in God and you believe in the powers of God, you will know that there is nothing that you, you can do because you know there is big power behind you. So believing God is necessary. That's where you're going to get, to get your energy from. That's why you're getting your push, push, push from God. Now, but it's not good enough to say I believe in God and go to sleep and say, God, please, <laughs> can you give me my daily bread, please? It's not going to come. The days of man are gone. Yeah? You don't say, well, God, I believe in you. Please help me to get some money tonight. It's not going to go today. It's not going to come. Once you believe in God, then you have to use the talents that the, the, the God gave you. You have to say, what can I do? But before you ask yourself, what can I do? There are things you must do to yourself. You must believe in yourself. You must believe that you can. You must believe that you've got power to do things, to make things move. If you're still not sure, then put on Ara Kelly CD. I would fly. Yeah? yeah. Play it. Here's a young here's a guy say I can fly, I could fly, I could fly. You know, he said I can. Yeah? If you want something to motivate you. Play this record, <laughs> but don't jump from the roof. But you know, <laughs> but you know what? Yeah. 
you can. So what I tell young people when I meet with them, I say, in the morning after your prayers, say to yourself a few words. I can, I must, I will. Every time you wake up in the morning, just say those few words and you are going to get a push. I can, I must, I will. I can because you are expressing confidence in yourself. You believe in yourself. I must because you must do it to survive. I will is a commitment. It's pointless saying that I can, I must, and then don't do anything. You say I can, I must, and what? I will. Yeah? You get that push. Um, then you have to look into other parameters of life. For example, now because I'm talking to you people, I've come in, oh, entrepreneurs already, and I've come entrepreneurs. Let me just now tell you, after I said I can, I must, I will, what did I do? Because of time, I'm not going to into the nitty gritty of my life, but let me t talk about business because you're here to, to learn about business. I had no capital, but that was not a, a problem. That was a challenge. Imagine waking up in the morning with empty pockets and you say, I'm, I can, I must, and I will, without money in your pocket. If it's a problem, if you think it's a problem, you may end up stealing. To me, it's also a problem. I say, yes, I'm going to make it in business. I can. So I identified a, a small product in the marketplace, which was in great demand, but not available. And it was a, a ballpoint pen. You know a ballpoint pen? Like a big? I once I'd go on the shop, the shops looking for a pen, they say, oh, not available, not available, not available, not available. Whereas other people saw that is a problem, I saw, I saw that is a challenge, it's an opportunity. And I said, I'm going to uh, get involved in ballpoint pen business. I know capital, but that's not a, not a problem. So, but I said, where do I start? So I was able to identify a manufacturer of ballpoint pens in Mombasa, in Kenya. And uh, because I wanted to add value to what I was selling, I, I went, I ordered the components of ballpoint pen from him. I had no money, but I was able to, uh, to, to arrange for a credit. Somebody uh, um, was there to say this man can be trusted. I bought my first consignment on credit, ballpoint pens, components of $4,000. I was given 30 days to pay back. That's for Mombasa. It was going to take about three, two, three days in, for a lorry to come from Mombasa to Dar es Salaam. And I had 30 days to pay. Assemble and pay. Three days, no delivery. Four days, five days, ten days, fifteen days, nothing happened. But that was not the problem. Then I, I, I say there is a challenge now. I owe these people four thousand dollars, and I've not the, the components have not arrived, and I have not sold anything. So what I did, I went to a, a, a big supply of pens in Dar es Salaam and say, my pens are coming. I'll sell my pens to you in advance. Where are they? They are somewhere between Mombasa and Dar es Salaam. He said, get lost. I said, no. <laughs> I said, no. But I was able to convince him. He bought my consignment wholly and paid me some $6,000 for, for the whole consi of the, that consignment. So when the, pen, when the components came, I had to assemble them. But I had no place to assemble them. So I used one of my two bedrooms in a little flat. So my first factory was my, my bedroom. 
after a while, my business grew, and I moved into the garden. There is something called hard work. There is no shortcut to success. You have to work hard. One mistake young people make is that when they are employed somewhere, they take it easy. After all, I'm getting my salary at the end of the month. But if you go to, you go, you take that route, even when you decide to, be, to go on your own, you're also going to be damn lazy. You won't make it. So the, the attributes of hard work, of necessity, must start at the time when you're employed, if you initially go through the employment route. If you are to look into the history of people who have, who have, go, have worked for some time, they went to, into self-employment, you will find that when they were employees, they were perhaps the, the best worker of the day, the best worker of, 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 of the year, and so forth. So the, the attributes of hard work must be there even when you are employed. Hard work. Then when you decide to go on your own, the principle which you should never, never forget is that you start small, but think big. If you start big and think small, <laughs> you're going to collapse. You start small. That's the natural way of doing things. The difference is that one is going to start small and grow very fast. The other one is going to think to start small and become a dwarf. Difference is how fast you move up the ladder. Always start small and think big. But when you start, you have to have in mind what I call destination. Where are you going? You know, you share a room with a friend, and one morning he or she says, I'm traveling. And he carries a little bag, say, I'll see you later. Half an hour later, she comes back. You know what? I think that's not the way I wanted to go. I don't want to go this way now. So, picks up that little bag again, I'm traveling, and goes that way. One hour later, she comes back and says, you know what? <laughs> I was going that way. I think I want to go that way. And then she goes that way. One hour later comes back, you know what? I want to go that way. You know, if you're good friends, you take her to hospital. You say she's confused. <laughs> yeah. But that is what's happened to our lives all the time. People don't know where they are going. They don't know of their destination. The moment you know your destination, you are going to have a plan of life. And every time you make a step forward, you say, hallelujah, I'm making it. I'm almost there. But if, if you don't have a destination, you will become what they call a rolling stone. A rolling stone gathers no more. Yeah? Because you go this way, you come back. Go this way, you come back. Come this way. So destination. And once you are grown your destination, then make a plan of your journey. You have to know where you are going. If you don't know where you are going, forgive me, but you are not different from that confused young lady or young man who just goes, comes back, goes that way and comes back. After a while, you, you meet 10 years down the road after um, university, and ask him, oh, how, where have you been? What, uh, how are you doing? You know, I went there, I came back, I went there, and I worked for that college, and that's this company, I was sacked, in there, you know, oh, they didn't pay me very well. And so, you know, at the end of the day, quite honestly, you end up with a totally confused life. So, destination, a destination. You have to know where you are going. I said, yes, you must say, I can. 
But you must see yourself, you are a winner. I asked one of the ladies, I think, um, yeah, how you, saw, you, how you see yourself. You, you must, uh, you, must um, you, know, have, you have a kid, and the child comes to you and, and says, after school, uh, end of the school term, say, how do you do it uh, at school this time? Say, well, you know, I was, I was number 20 out of a class of, of, um, of 40. And he, and he said, ha, huh, you must work hard. What do you want to, what, what, what number do you want to be next time? I'm going to struggle very, very hard. I want to be number five. You know, I said, son, you failed. What's wrong with number one? So the moment you aspire for anything less than number one, you failed because you've accepted failure. You have to parade yourself as number one. You are a young woman, and you've got your, bo your boyfriend. And you go and tell your boyfriend, you know, I think Mary is very beautiful. You know what? He's going to pack you and go to Mary. Because, because you are, you are, you are telling him all the time, Mary is better than me, Mary is better than me. You have to say, I'm better than Mary. But don't take a second position. If I observe young women walking along the corridors, I know who are number one and who are number two and who are number nothing. The way they walk. The number one will walk and you turn up and look. The number three, number four, we say, the work will tell you. There are some are working with confidence. There are people who are not working with confidence. The ones who are working with confidence say, I am number one. I am the one. But remember, the price you put on yourself, the position you give yourself, Nobody can improve it. If you carry yourself as, not, as, as number two, number three, number four, nobody is going to say, come up to number one. You are in a business venture. You say, I am the best in this venture. I am going to make it. I am the winner. I am not the loser. I will give you an example. You take this watch. I am a shopkeeper. I have seen this watch. And you come to me, and ask, you ask me the price. And I say, yes, it's uh, $100. Your immediate reaction is, Could it, can't it be a bit cheaper? That's your reaction. Unless you are crazy, you are not going to tell the shopkeeper, why don't you make it $200? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You, you can't tell the, the shopkeeper, make it 200. No. You may want to, to ask him to make it 90 or 80, isn't it? So the moment you put a value on yourself, nobody's going to increase that value. So put the highest value in your, on yourself, put the highest value on your ability, put the highest value in your position, because nobody's going to say, go up. People try to pull you down all the time. So carry yourself as number one. Carry yourself as a winner. If you parade yourself as a loser, nobody's going to say, stand up, you're the winner. No. Nobody's going to do that. So if you go into any business and say, I'm number one, I'm the best. I'm the best, I'm the best, and I'm the best. And then, I have to give you time to, I can't, <laughs> I'm taking too much time. But um, businesses have um, ups and downs, which you call challenges, which are called challenges. When you face challenges, don't give up quickly and say, I'm losing, I'm losing. And if you still don't believe yourself that you are a survivor, you go and get the uh, record by Destiny Child, I'm a survivor, <laughs> and, and play it to yourself until you believe you are, all, you are a survivor. <laughs> because you should never see yourself as a failure in business. Say, so you're always going to survive. Um, 
Let me just touch briefly on the, now you've, you've made it in life, you're, you're doing your business, you believe in yourself, there are things you must observe, for example, your word, always make sure that your word is your honor. Tomorrow is tomorrow. If you make a promise, fulfill it. Some people tell, I tell you, come tomorrow, and then when tomorrow comes, uh, they are not there. Um, if you're going to expand, for God's sake, try to, ex to delegate. And once you delegate, believe in people delegate to. Don't delegate half-heartedly. If you delegate and you're comfortable, delegate with trust. Forgive me, girls, but um, you cannot be half pregnant. You're either pregnant or not pregnant. Yeah? Yeah? You can't. <laughs> you, you, I'm, so, I'm sorry. You, okay, you cannot be half pregnant. You're either pregnant or not. So, so you either trust someone or you don't trust someone. But you don't trust someone halfway. Yeah? Yeah? So you delegate. That's how you can expand. You cannot expand if you are just carrying everything in your own pocket, in your own little head. You must delegate. You must trust people. You must have confidence people you, trust, you, 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 you delegate to. Otherwise, they won't be able to perform because they won't have that commitment. And when you, you trust people, when you employ people to help you, there are two things you must observe, but in that order. Commitment and competence. And not competence and commitment. No. Commitment of that person to your business and the confidence uh, and competence of that person. So if you get someone to assist you, to help you along, go for two qualities, two attributes in that order. Commitment and then com competence. If a person is committed, you can improve on his performance, on her performance. But if a person is competent and not committed, he could even cheat you. He will manipulate things because he's very competent. So always look for commitment when you're growing your small your businesses and then competence. But above all, the people you are going to recruit in your, your operations you must build in them a sense of belonging. They have to say, that's our business, and not your business. The moment they say it's your business, you are gone. Because to him or to her, he's, he's no longer a custodian of the business assets, because it's your business, your business. But if you say it's our business, it's very, very important. So the sense of ownership, sense of belonging, is important, it's very critical. Now, you have made money, and you are making money. You have to go back again to God. And then um, you must realize that um, at the end of the day, is actually God's blessing. Because you say to yourself, there you are, you are other young people you are born with, they are all gone a long time ago. Um, there are some other young girls who are born. You are you are you were born at the same time that they couldn't be making school. You put your neighbors who were born in physical incapacitated. So you know you find the whole environment that made you what you are. You can say it's just a blessing. If that's the case, then you have to find a way of saying thank you. Thank you to God for being for blessing you. But also thank you to the people who've made you rich. My money has come from the rich and the poor. A blind person goes to the shop to buy a Coca-Cola. The shop will, give, will not give that blind or poor person free Coca-Cola. The poor person will have to pay for the Coca-Cola. But I'm the maker of Coca-Cola. So when he buys that Coca-Cola, that bottle of Coca-Cola, part of that money comes to me because I made the Coca-Cola. So, but if by any chance I was walking down the road 
And I bumped this very, very poor person, he said, he totally physically incapacitated. He said, Mr. Mengi, please take this dollar. I want to help you. I said, no, 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 please. I'll pass take another dollar out from my pocket and give it to him. Yeah? I can't take his money. But in reality, he was not taking it. In reality, he was not taking, taking his money through the purchase of my products. So, so you have to find a way. Look, my wealth has come partly from very rich people, other people, and very, very poor people. Find a way of giving back that little money you got for that poor man. Because part of my coca income has come from that poor person. So when you are helping some of the poor people, you are just giving back what you took from them. Once upon a time, they bought your, your products. So I believe helping the poor you are doing two things. You are saying thank you to them for buying your products. Can I give you something back? And you are saying thank you to God. You've given me the opportunity to be able to help my fellow people who are less fortunate than I am. But in, help, in, in giving something back to society, it's not just, it's not just about giving individuals, so help individuals, but it's also an issue of the environment and other social responsibilities. You have to play a role in protecting the environment. But number one contribution, if you're in business, number one contribution to environment is not to pollute environment. Yeah? That's your number one contribution. In your business, do not pollute the environment. It's pointless kind of activities where you pollute the environment, and that's where you say, well, I'm supporting tree planting program. But you are a polluter. So your, your contribution, number one contribution is not to pollute. And then you support environmental programs uh, to ensure that um, we leave the world in a better place than we found it. Um, The, the way a rich person in a, in a society where a majority of people, people are poor, the way that person relates to the rest of the society is different from the way he relates, relates uh, 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 it's different from the way, way my American counterpart relates to the people. Here I'm surrounded by poor people. In America, you could live in a, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a in a place where you see affluence most of the time. So, to me, I feel I've got more responsibility to more people here who need my support. Your population, in America, is something like 250 or so million people. You 300, 300. 300. You have about uh, four, three, four million homeless people in America. But it's nothing, it's, it's, a, it's a figure, but very small, yeah? But here, you're talking of a huge percentage of our people living in poverty. So, so, so my, my, my attitude, in Amer American rich person will show off his rich. But here, we have to show humility, because we are just a few who are very lucky compared to the majority. So, social responsibility, in terms of community support, in terms of environment, is necessary. The money spent on, um, on environmental issues, the money spent on social issues, should not be seen as a necessary cost to business. It must be seen as part and parcel of necessary costs to run an operation or to run business. So don't cry over money which you spend on environment. Don't cry over money which you spend on, on uh, alleviating the suffering of the poor. You should see it as, um, as money well spent. At the end of the day, you must remember one thing. Put this way. If you walk down the street on your own, um, Bruce, if you don't know, Professor, 
just walking down the street laughing. <laughs> On your own. So, guys, huh? He's going mad. Sorry, Professor. <laughs> going mad. <laughs> but the moment you hold someone's hand, and two of you walk down the street laughing, all three of you, all four of you, you are, you are laughing. We shall start envying you. Oh, they are so lucky. They are so happy. Because there is no individual happiness. Happiness is collective. And the more of you who are happy, the better. Happiness is collective, it's not individual. Therefore, in a poor country, you have to do all that's necessary to make more and more people happy. Because the, very, the rich are very few. The rich are very few. You must bring this blanket of happiness more and more people. You are still young. I don't want to talk of death, but I must, I must say a few words about death. <laughs> At the end of the day, remember two things. When you go, you take nothing with you. Nothing, nothing. Then, what does it mean? It means second observation, and that is people will be remembered by not, not by the amount of money they leave behind, not um, by amount of wealth they've accumulated and left behind. You'll be remembered by how you used the money you created. You'll be remembered by how you used God's blessings that you, uh, that you got. You'll be remembered by what you did with your money. You are not going to be remembered by the money you left in the city bank and the buildings you, 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 you left in Madison Square. No. You'll be remembered by what you did with the money which you made. I believe, I believe there are two types of people. One lot of people, when they die physically, the body dies, they die and go, disappear. The other lot of people, when the bodies die, they live on. They live on in people's hearts. And um, as you walk through the journey of life, remember, yes, you want big, big money, but yes, think of how you're going to use that money so that at the end of the day, when you go, people can say, yes, Bruce is still living on, although he went out, he disappeared 200 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. You cannot go into business without taking risk. But it means, I'm not saying you go foolishly, stupidly. You have to be able to assess the risk. Nobody is going to tell you, do that or don't do that. Or, no, you have to feel it. Sometimes it's just what we call gut feeling. Yeah, gut feeling. And, 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 and honestly, you have to do some, some quick work in your head. Should I, should I not? But risk must be calculated. You must work on the risk. Um, and, and uh, nobody, you know, there is something inside you which has to go or not go. But the difference between you and uh, a, a small villager is that you will be able to carry out a quick assessment of the risk. Yeah? The guy down the street, the villager may not be able to do that. But you have learned parameters uh, within which you are going to do something. Um, but, but uh, yes, there are no don'ts and do's in life, in business. Um, but the biggest, biggest enemy of entrepreneurship is something called fear. Fear. You are too scared to take a risk. And you know what? Many people fail before they start. Yeah? Can you do this? And, oh no, 
I'm not educated enough. Oh no, I'm too old. Well, do you know McDonald? Yeah? Do you know who started McDonald? Croc. How old was he? He was 53. He was a sick man, he lost one of his lungs. Many people at that age and so sick will say, I give up. I'm scared. He was diabetic, he was everything. But you know, Croc said, No, I'm going to do it. He wasn't scared. But the other guy would say, I'm too old. And Croc said, I'm not too old. I'm going to do it. So fear of age, fear of this, fear of that, is a terrible, um, terrible enemy of entrepreneurship. Fear. Fear to start. Fear to attempt. If you feel scared, sit back and say, I can. I must. I, must, I will. <laughs> and you move on. You have to be honest. Um, nobody should catch you should catch you cheating. Yeah? And uh, and uh, don't assume everybody is a fool. Don't uh, if you if you put up your case honestly, people and people people will believe in you. But if they find an element of cheating in what you are saying, they will they will shun you. They will run away from you. So be honest. Call the spade a spade. To me, best honesty is so important. Yeah? Be honest. Be honest. You can still make big, big money through being honest. You don't have to go this way, this way, that would make money. You can go straight <laughs> and still make money. Uh, so, so convince someone. Try to convince, but have your mind set and convince someone to buy your idea. I had to convince that manager to buy my pens, show them, you know, they were going to be delivered. He trusted me they would be delivered. I had to convince him he's going to make money if he sells because I gave him good price. So he, he bought my idea. Um, persuasion. Persuasion. There are people who persuade or negotiate uh, through cheating. Okay, you, you get your way first, first negotiate, first contract, but not the second one. And let the person you are negotiating with believe in you. But nobody can believe in you if you don't believe in yourself. Nobody. Go there with confidence. Show that you know what you are talking about. Show that you know your product. Show the, the testimony you're giving, show that it's, it's true. Believe in yourself. Believe in your contract, in, 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 your, pro, uh, in, in your, your product. If you don't believe in your product, if you don't believe in yourself, why on earth should I believe in you? Go there with confidence. And then always say, I'm number one. And my product is number one. Let him buy into that idea. Or let him buy into the idea. And with confidence, he will say, yes, I'll take your product. Very much. Sure, is. but the, the most important is the, the ballpoint pen. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, let me tell you about the ballpen pen. You may not believe me. <laughs> that hand, hand assembly or hand operation gave me my first million dollars in year one. In the first year? One year. Oh, it was so stupid. Everybody thought it was useless. You don't know how hard it was to find a pen made in Tanzania. <laughs> <laughs> But you know, sometimes don't ignore the little things you think is too, too small. Um, after, you know, one thing, please, you must remember. There is no job or activity for the educated and for the uneducated. The village will make pancakes and put them open and um, sell them and flies, uh, full of flies, you go and, <sighs> but for me, I'll pack it nicely because I know the rules of hygiene. For her, she'll make a pancake, uh, two ounces, uh, two, two grams, ten grams, um, there are ten of them, each one different weights. But for me, I'll make sure they are, they are, they, 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 they are uniform, uh, 25 grams each, whatever. So, the difference between work or business does not lie in the nature. 
lies in the way you do it. Yeah? With your education, you do it better, more efficiently. You find ways of mechanizing. When this poor person will just be using your hands to make the little uh, scones or something like that. So don't shine away from a job. It's, it's just for the uneducated. It's not that way. Not that way. Thank you very much, indeed, and God bless you. Thank you.